I'm gonna ask you to help me. You know how this goes. I start with a really interesting story, get you engaged this morning, connect you to the message. So I thought we'd collaborate a little bit on that. So what I need you to think about this morning is a topic or an issue that's divisive. <laughs> Took about a half a second, didn't it? Um, that wasn't a whole lot of work. Um, now take that issue, and now I want you to imagine the people on either side of that issue. How do they relate to each other? What do they think about each other? And now we're going to take a person from either side of that issue. So pick them out in your mind, and we're going to imagine that they have just come through the Northwest Bible Church new member process. And they spent the last few months getting to know each other, and they've joined us here in the service today. So maybe we don't imagine them sitting right side by side. Maybe they're like on either side of the room where they kind of keep an eye on each other. And I want you to just take that picture and keep it in your mind as we go through the message because we'll refer back to them from time to time. And you'll see immediately why I started set this up this way as we go to the text. We're in Philippians chapter 4 this morning, verse 2. And Paul starts out and says, I entreat Judea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. I urge you to agree in the Lord. There's your conflict. Two people on either side of an issue. And whatever it is, whatever the conflict, whatever the, whatever the tension they have between them, they can't get past it by themselves. So Paul calls on somebody else in the church to help. He says in verse 3, yes, I ask you also, true companion. Now this is just, I'm going to say this is somebody, we don't get a proper name here from our vantage point. But the church at Philippi, reading the letter from Paul, they know who he's talking about. And he calls on a particular individual in the church to help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, what just happened? Again, Paul's writing a letter from prison. He's writing to the Philippian church. They've sent one of their members to care for him minister to him while he's in prison. And he's caught Paul up on the goings-on in Philippi, and Paul's writing a letter back to the church. And they're reading the letter together, maybe on a Sunday morning like this, and they're going through, and you can see all through the letter, Paul's theme of oneness and unity and humility and selflessness. And then we get to this point, and he names names, calls them out. And i got to imagine it would be just as awkward then as it would be today, and everybody's sitting there with their stomach in knots thinking two things. I can't believe he called them out, and I hope I'm not next. <laughs> is this why Paul wrote the letter? Is, is this the big issue? Is he talking about, has, has all this talk of unity and oneness and selflessness been leading up to this gotcha moment? We're really talking about you. Or is there a broader issue in the church? And I think that's worth asking. I wanted to look at it a little bit by going back through some verses in the earlier, earlier on in the letter. We get to chapter 1 and verse 9, and Paul is just so thankful to have the Philippians as partners in the gospel. He loves this church. But he says in verse 9, and my prayer for you is that your love may abound more and more. Is that there's some room for more love in the church. And then we add to that verse 124, where Paul's thinking about in prison, about sitting in prison, maybe I don't make it out of here. And he says, I want to go and be with Jesus, but it's necessary that I remain here with you for your progress in the faith. And then we get to chapter 2 and verse 2, and he's talked about all the joy he has for the Philippian church. He says, complete my joy by being of one mind. As if Paul is saying to the church, I see where you want to go, I see where you need to go, and I want to take you there. As if there's room for growth. So I'm, I would say that just from looking at everything in the text, that everybody there needs to hear this. So if everybody needs to hear it, why call these two out in person like this? What are they arguing about anyway? What's the tension? Well, 
I don't know what the tension is. <clears throat> Paul, did, Paul didn't get specific. But I think we can look at a little bit of the text and make some assumptions. I don't think they're arguing over a theological issue or a doctrinal issue. Paul covers that in chapter 3. Somebody is saying, people are out there saying, it's Jesus plus circumcision. That gives us righteousness. And Paul says, no, not at all. It's not in us. It's all about Christ. Nothing on self will get us to righteousness. So it's, I don't think it's a theological um, argument between them. I don't think it's a moral or a sin issue. Again, for a lot of the same reasons. I think Paul would call that out specifically. He can't ask, there's certain things that are going to come between them, like a doctrinal issue or theological issue, where he says, I'm not asking you to agree on that. Same way as a sin issue. He's not going to ask them to agree in the Lord over something somebody's doing that's obviously wrong. He's called several things out in his, letter, his other letters, 1 Corinthians, several specific sins. So if it's not a theological issue, and it's not a moral issue, what's left? I think it's a personal issue. I'm going to say it's a personal issue between these two. Something's gotten in the way of their relationship. And Paul is asking them to agree in the Lord. What does he mean to agree in the Lord? What, what is he saying here? I don't think he means just agree. Paul calls for a oneness in Philippians, but I don't, think he, I don't think he understands that to mean just because we become believers and we join together in one congregation, become one church, that we all become the same, that we're going to think the same all the time, come to the same conclusions, and make the same choices. I mean, Crystal and I are going to be lucky if we agree, in the Lord, if we agree on lunch today, right? Um, so if he's not expecting this oneness to result in this absolute sameness, in all of us, is he just saying, let's agree to disagree. And I want to be careful. The more I read this passage, the more I really didn't like that phrase that I use a lot. Because um, here's what I mean when I say it sometimes. Um, I'm tired of listening to you. You're obviously not listening to me or you'd agree with me because I'm right. So why don't you go be wrong somewhere else? Um, not exactly the spirit of unity and oneness that Paul is calling for here. I think it's more than that. It's a higher calling. He doesn't say, y'all need to get on the same side of everything and go that direction. He's not saying, let's just agree to disagree. He's saying, let's just recognize the fact that we're sinners saved by grace. We're coming together in one body of Christ, and let's let everything else in our relationship flow out of that truth. I think it's a higher calling. As he says, agree in the Lord. But it's not just that simple, is it? We can be pretty passionate about our preferences. Um, and Paul's not diminishing the fact that there's a difference. I don't think he's saying, I don't want you ever to disagree. I think it's how they're dealing with it that, it, that, he's, that he's speaking to. And so how do we get to a place where we can get past our passions and agree in the Lord. And I think the verses that follow don't necessarily give us a formula, but I think it gives us some principles and some things to think about to get us moving in the direction, get our hearts and our minds together so we can agree in the Lord. And Paul starts out by saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Kind of an odd place to start as I started thinking about it. Calling these two out, you two agree in the Lord, and he goes right to rejoice in the Lord. Until I started looking at how else he's used it in the letter. And we, again, we're going to look at several instances, and we go back to chapter 1, and Paul, again, is sitting in prison, and he's thinking about, there's these people out there that are trying to do me harm, take advantage of the fact that I'm in prison, but I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I think he says rejoice there, because the gospel's going forth. Later on in chapter 2, he's sitting there, maybe you don't make it out of this, but even if I'm poured out like a drink offering and I die in here, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord and you should rejoice with me. So he's dealing with the tension of attack while he's in prison and the attention of just a life and death issue and he can rejoice. 
And then we get to chapter 3, and he says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord, but watch out for the dogs, the evildoers, the mutilators of the flesh. These people that are out there adding to the gospel with circumcision. And the tension Paul feels there of just frustration with what they're saying and speaking against it, and really later on in chapter 3, the pain. He, he goes to, comes to tears thinking about it. And that conflict, he can say rejoice. And then we get here in chapter 4. Agree in the Lord and rejoice in the Lord. And I think this is just, this is Paul's go-to. It's, it's his call to arms. It reminded me of uh, Reveille or the bugle call. We all stand to attention and, and we know what to do. We have a tradition here. When you hear me say, God is good, what do you say? All the time. Instant unity. Whatever the tension, whatever the conflict, whatever was on your mind before that I said that, we're all in agreement. And Paul focuses our attention on rejoicing in the Lord and taking us to the Lord in that moment. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Your reasonableness or your gentleness. Does this really work? Have you ever won an argument by being nice? Um, you win arguments by being louder and bolder and stronger than the other side, right? That's what we want to do. And Paul says, not in the church. We don't do it that way. He goes back to chapter 2, verse 14. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Because in this crooked and twisted generation, you shine like lights in the world. That's, this is part of our witness. we got to show people that this gospel we preach on Sunday morning has taken root in here and made a difference so they can see it out there. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Now, he's not reminding them here of the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that they have as believers, which is true. He's not reminding them that Jesus is close in their sufferings which is true, he's, he, this is eschatological language. This is the third time he's used it in the letter. And he's saying the Lord's return is at hand. It could happen before I'm, I'm through with this message today. And he paints a picture for us at the end of chapter 3 and verse 20. And he says, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, Jesus Christ. And he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. He's imagining, he wants us to think about a unity and a oneness that we don't even know what it means. We can't even imagine it here. And it's right there. And he wants us to live today in this unity as if we're going to walk into the presence of the Lord together. Just in a few minutes. The Lord is at hand. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You may have used that in the last couple of weeks. It's one of our go-to verses for comfort and peace that we have. And if I could take a survey this morning, we could list a thousand fears that are on our minds. They'd all boil down to just two things. We're afraid of losing what we have or not getting what we want. It's all we worry about. What are these two worried about? They've just been called out for their conflict. They're probably, looking at the text, leaders in the church. This was not done to shame them. Paul respects who they are, respects their faith. He serves side by side with the gospel in them. And he says, agree in the Lord. What are they afraid of losing? What are they afraid of not getting? Have you ever heard the question, would you rather be right, or would you rather be in relationship? Because so many times, 
that rightness, holding on to it is gonna cost you in relationship. And 90% of the time, in that moment, it's gonna feel worth it. It's worth it for them this morning. They're sitting in church on a Sunday morning and they'd rather be right than be in relationship. And Paul calls them out on it. And he calls them to make their request known to God. You know, if you and I are arguing, you know what I want and I know what you want. The problem is we're not budging. And I've probably been telling everybody I know how hard you are to get along with and how unreasonable you are in this argument. And Paul, I think, just asked the question, have you been as passionate toward the Lord in sharing this request and this conflict as you have with everybody else? Make your request known to the Lord. Pray about this. And as we let go of what we're afraid of losing, if we let go of what I'm afraid I'm not going to get, then the peace of God can come in and change things. And it guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It guards our hearts from fear. That's what, he's, that's what he's speaking to, be anxious for nothing. And it can also guard our hearts from anger and resentment. Because just one thing worse, I'm not getting what I want. It's watching you get what you want at my expense. <laughs> and this is a reminder, this is a supernatural thing Paul's talking about. It's not in us to not fear and not get angry. This is God doing something supernatural in the moment and the real peace of God coming in. And it's not a peace of, it's not a, a peace like that of answered prayer. This is a peace that lets Paul sit in prison and say, you should hear who I'm getting to witness to in here. Those people out there trying to do me harm, God bless the fact that they're sharing the gospel. This is a powerful peace and it guards our hearts and it guards our minds. Look where Paul wants our minds in the next verse. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What are these things? These are heavenly things. Paul takes our mind from here to the Lord again. Worthy of worship. There's nothing here worthy of worship. Only God, only Christ. There's nothing here pure, absolutely pure. There's nothing here absolutely true. This word of God, this, ta- this is a tangible thing I can touch. It's not of those, this world. This is divine. And I think he calls our minds toward heaven in contrast to the world in chapter 3. Because he, go- he goes back to chapter 3 and he talks about the enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. All they know is what they want to consume. They glory in their shame with their minds set on earthly things. That's the problem. We're called to live in this world. But if all we are worried about constantly is how I'm not going to lose something or I'm not going to get what I want, it's just going to end in selfishness and divisiveness. So Paul ends this section in verse 9. And he says, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. And I think all he's saying there is, I'm not asking you to do anything today that I haven't done, that I'm unwilling to do. He said, I'm, I think he's saying, I'm, I'm talking the talk in this letter to you, but I'm walking the walk as I rejoice in prison. And as I sit here and praise God that the gospel is getting shared, even though I'm trapped in here. Now, that's the text this morning. I wanted to share a personal story about how this impacted me recently. These very words. Um, Neil and I were talking, maybe December, January, and he was reading off a list of sermon topics and scripture passages. I didn't know what he was doing. And he got to the end of it, and he said, I need you to pick one of these and preach on it. And I was like, oh, this just makes me nervous. And I said, I'll think about it. Meaning, I hope you forget about it between now and the next time I see it. Um, but I went home, and I got up the next morning, attention. Um, I thought, what if he makes me do this? 
Um, so I started trying to think of what was he saying, what were those passages, and Philippians came to mind. I thought, well, that's just four chapters. I can read that, go through it, and see what I see. So I read that while I was drinking my coffee, and, and I get through with Philippians, and I can, I can see the story. I can see what Paul's doing in the letter. And I go get ready, and then chapter 4 comes in. And I just, that sits with me and connects with me in this conflict. Um, agree in the Lord. And something about it just caught me. And i got to be honest, the first thing I thought of was like, people who need to hear that message. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, they could agree in the Lord, and they could do to agree in the Lord. Um, God often convicts me on behalf of other people. <laughs> and then it just stopped. And he said something just as clearly as he's ever said anything to me, you can't preach this message with integrity because you've been holding a grudge for 10 years. And he was right, um, which he is. Um, 10 years ago, just coming on staff, and I was in a meeting here, and it wasn't somebody in the church, but it was he's connected to the church and helped, had helped us process things and come to decisions before. So we're sitting in a meeting and a course of action was suggested. I didn't agree with it. Um, I didn't like it. And I th I'm thinking, well, he's, he sees right through this. He's going to tell them it's a bad idea. And he said, that's a great idea. Well, I got no use for him anymore. So <laughs> I just kind of checked out, distanced myself. The problem was this wasn't just a one and done thing. I got to deal with this guy for the next 10 years. He keeps coming. We keep having meetings. I keep not liking him. I keep disagreeing with him, and just this resentment is here until we get to Philippians 4. And that morning, I knew exactly what I had to do. And so I went from here to the, I went from home to here, and I sent an email and I set up a lunch with him for the next time he was in Dallas. And we're waiting to get our food, and he said, you know, I've been coming here for 10 years or so. Um, and out of everybody on staff, I know you the least. I was like, I wonder why. <laughs> so we sat down and, and had lunch, and I just told him the story uh, about the message, about Philippians. And then I just started to feel the tension. I was like, oh, I don't want to say it. And I said, I've held a grudge for you, a grudge against you for 10 years. And you could just see kind of the question on his face, the, the why, the, maybe the pain. Um, and I explained it went back to that meeting, and I just had to ask his forgiveness. I said, I know you're a believer. I know you're doing what God's called you to do. And can you forgive me? This separation that you, this distance you're feeling, he didn't really know about it. Um, but I said, that's intentional. That's on me, just because of my pettiness. And he was gracious. He forgave me. And we went from lunch into one of these long planning meetings again. And I had a completely different experience because um, I walked in that meeting in agreement in the Lord with him, just recognizing he's a broken believer just like me, as desperate in, as desperately in need of grace as I am. And I was able to sit in there, and I just look at this passage, and I'm, uh, my um, message I would say today is this works. That, that peace of God that Paul's talking about here, I've got it. It just showed up as I was obedient in that. And I sat through the rest of that meeting. Again, just God doing something in me I couldn't do myself. Just absolutely miraculous. So it's so amazing to be a part of that. So that's my story. That's the text, and that's a story of me. So what do we do with that today? How do... How do you deal with this. Wanted to give you a couple applications, and I had a couple options. So I could get out my list and just start naming names. <laughs> Don't get too tense. I decided not to do that. Um, but I wanted to show you a picture, give you an opportunity to do some self-reflection and just do a little bit of work and maybe some homework um, here today and through this week. And this is a picture I show a lot of people uh, of this is how I think about relationship. Any, but any relationship you come to, there's a me and a you and an us. 
And I want to start, the, the us that we'll focus on here is agreement in the Lord. So that's, that's our context today. And I wanted everybody here to answer this question first. If where it says me, you put your name, and where it says you, you put God, are you in agreement in the Lord with God? And all I'm asking there is, can you agree with God that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for us, for our sins, and he rose again that we might have eternal life? Have you put your, eternal tr your, your trust in eternal life in that truth? If you haven't, if there's a question there, this is your homework. I want you just to spend some time with this. Pray about it. Take it this week. Pray that God would bring you that peace that he's talking about there. Because really, if you don't have that, the rest of this doesn't apply to you. Like I was saying, this is a miraculous process. And I think an agreement in the Lord in this context is two believers coming together and God doing a miracle and, and with them. And so if you're still thinking about this, am I in a full agreement with God? Just pray about that. If you can say yes to that, talking to the family, to Northwest Bible Church. And I'm going to draw the circle pretty small, like Paul did to the Philippians. And I want where it says me, you put your name. Where it says you, I want you to put a couple of sets of initials, potentially. One in light of our vision. Is there somebody out there that you would like to be in agreement in the Lord with, but you can't because they're not a believer? Begin to pray for opportunities for conversations about Jesus with them. Pray that God would open their eyes to the gospel. The other person, other set of initials, maybe you have somebody, maybe you don't. But I'd like you to start praying, is there anybody in the church that you have tension with, that you have conflict with, that you're not, you can't say we're in agreement in the Lord? I'd like you just to pray about that. And here's a few questions to get you thinking. Do I have somebody like that? Well, I want you to just answer these three questions. Is there somebody, when you show up on a Sunday morning here, that you avoid? You're going across the parking lot, and you're like, oh, wait, they're going in the door. Is there somebody that you see them when you get here, and they just make you mad? They just frustrate the heck out of you? And the third question, is there somebody here that you complain about on a regular basis to other people? That may give you a clue that there's work to do. And I don't know what that work is. God told, when, when God revealed this to me, I knew exactly what to do with it. And I trust that the Holy Spirit will tell you. But this unity that God is calling to, that, that Paul is calling us to, is vital. It's our witness. And so I just wanted you to spend some time with that this week as homework. And it's really a perfect opportunity for us as we go to the, as we prepare to go to the table this morning, it's an opportunity for all of, of, all of us to prepare. So before we get there and go to the table together, I just want you to think about this and explain this a little bit here. If you were unable to say, I'm in agreement with the Lord, I'm, I'm in agreement in the Lord with God, I want you to think about just letting the elements pass when the ushers do that in just a minute. Because what we're saying here, not that you're not welcome here, not that we don't want to fellowship with you, not that we don't love you, but what we're saying when we do this and come to the table is one of the most unifying things we have here today to remind us of what Jesus did for us. And we're saying by taking it that we believe it. And if you don't, if you have questions, that's perfectly okay. Let those elements pass. And then believers, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we don't do this just because. We do it because Jesus died for us, rose again. But we do it, we do it remembering what he did for us and we don't do it flippantly. So spend some time. There may be times that you decide to let that plate pass because there's unresolved conflict or there's unconfessed sin. There's something between you and the Lord and you're not quite ready to come to the table. And I promise you, if that's you this morning, it is hard to let that plate pass when you're used to doing it every time. But if you let that plate pass and just let God do a work, 
and next month when we take it again. It's a miraculous experience I've done that. So I just want you to think about, as we reflect this us, this oneness, am I in agreement with the Lord, with everybody I need to be, in preparation to go to the table.